Nothing will crush a real estate investor's spirit like landlord stress. The difference between being successful and miserable in managing properties is education. Welcome to Landlord University, where landlords learn. Landlord University is recorded from inside the rent prep office where Stephen White and Jeff Pearson share the lessons learned from working with some of the most successful landlords. Welcome to Landlord University Night School. I'm Jeff Pearson. I'm here with my co-host, Stephen White. Hello, Stephen. How are you doing this evening? Uh, pretty good, Jeff. So we're, we're covering a topic today that's going to be pretty heavy with opinion because um, we're not covering something that's black and white in a lot of cases or certainly anything that's law. Uh, we're talking about uh, obtaining bank, bank statements from your potential tenants, from your applicants during the screening process. So you're using those bank statements as verification of their income um, or verification of their employment. And uh, I, th I think a lot of landlords have the ideas wrong or, or crisscrossed on when to ask for the bank statements or should you mandate it or make it a requirement. So I thought it'd be a good thing to uh, you know, really dive deeper into that and, and get some good discussion going on when landlords should ask for a bank statement. Sounds good. So we've, we've covered in a previous episode um, when you're verifying uh, self-employment income. So if somebody owns their own business, uh, we run into this a lot of times. Somebody cleans houses for a living or they do babysitting or something like that. Or, you know, maybe it's a larger business. Maybe they're the CEO of a company and there's 50 employees or whatever the case is. Um, in that case, there's no pay stubs. And if you own a business, you know as well as I do that taxes aren't always going to give you the most uh, realistic impression of what their income is. Um, so in that case, bank statements really are the only way that you're going to get a really true feel for what their income is on a month to month basis. You know, what is it on average? Because we all know that business can go up and down. But if I look at 90 days worth of bank statements and I see that this person, you know, transfers on average $5,000 a month uh, into their bank account, I can safely assume that they're they have an income level of $5,000 a month, despite the fact that maybe one month they transferred $8,000 or one month they transferred $3,000. You know, I take that three into consideration, but I'm going to usually average it out and say, okay, I'm looking at three months worth of bank statements. This is the income literally coming into their bank that that's, you know, usable money for them. Right. In regular cases. So if you've got, you know, John Smith who works at McDonald's or wherever it is, and he's got an actual employment and he's got pay stubs and he's got, you know, employment history and he gives you a name to, to a supervisor to, to make a phone call to and verify his employment. You know, you take all the traditional steps of verification. There is no sense in asking for a bank statement. And I know some landlords will absolutely say, no way, you know, I always require them or, or, you know, that's part of my policy. And my biggest reason for saying you don't need them is, I believe that it scares too many tenants away. And it's a very common phone call that we get here at Rent Prep from people who have our Rent Prep application that the landlord handed to them. The landlord says, I need your bank statements. And so the person calls the logical, you know, company that they would think is has some sort of hand in this. And it's usually us. And they say, oh, you know, I see that I'm submitting this information to you. Do I have to submit my bank statements? I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, so I think it's something that I've, I've noticed a huge resistance from people. I think that that's getting into an area that it's unnecessary, and I don't think that people feel very comfortable doing it. If you're self-employed, I think it comes with the territory, and you're used to that sort of um, exposure in a lot of ways. Exactly. You know, you know you don't have pay stubs or a W-2 to submit as proof, and so you just know it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a part of life. Right. But as a, you know, as somebody who's got a nine to five job and, you know, they're a, they're a regular payroll employee, this can be really invasive to them. You know, they, they're, they're not comfortable. You, th you think people aren't comfortable giving a social security number, ask them for 90 days worth of their bank statements. You, you <laughs> right. know, they're probably going to give you the social security number with no problem. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a weird thing because they just, it's not something that they're asked for very often. You know, think about it as a homeowner. You get a, you know, you apply for a mortgage or you're refinancing or something. You give them your bank information. It's part of the standard. It's how you go. But if you're a, if you're somebody who's rented your whole life, think about how many situations you would have ever had to give your bank statements over. Probably not very often. No. And especially for a rental situation, especially if you've never been asked before, 
as a landlord, you're going to come across as a very difficult to work with landlord. And I can tell you right now, and it happens all the time, we see it firsthand, it's going to scare away a lot of potentially good tenants. And that's why, in my opinion, I do not think it's even worth uh, asking for. I don't think it's worth the conversation unless they specifically meet your, again, we talk about this all the time, your screening criteria. If part of your screening criteria is they have to provide pay stubs, and they they can't meet that because they don't have pay stubs. Well, then you should default to you know option B, which is bank statements in the event that they don't have pay stubs because they're self employed. Right. But I don't think that getting bank statements up front should be an option in just a regular screening. I think it's going to turn it's going to do more harm than good for sure. Yeah, that really does make sense. And you know, when you have pay stubs and you have credit history, you have a pretty good idea of what their debt to income ratio is, which is really what you're looking for. I could see it if you're dealing with somebody who just doesn't have the credit history to, you know, if, if they, they have no credit, you know, they, they show up with, with no credit cards or anything. Maybe at that point you start to wonder, well, you know, do they do everything on a cash basis? Um, you know, what is their, their income flow? But again, this goes back to what we just talked about the other day. Good guys finish last. Yeah. You can come up with all of the what ifs and you could think, well, you know, maybe I should get the, the bank statement just to clarify this for me. But the bottom line is if the credit report looks good, if the pay stubs look good and you don't have the evictions, then, you know, you've, you've set your standards you work to those standards, and odds are more often than not, you're going to come out pretty good. There are not too many people in this day and age that aren't operating on some level of credit and showing up in the in the credit reports for the cars sure. that they bought, the credit cards that they have, and all of the the revolving credit that they have. And those are the things that you want to be uh, particularly aware of and pay attention to. You're absolutely right. You know, setting those standards of debt to income uh, or income to rent ratio, which is usually yes. two, yeah. two and a half to three times um, the the rent is what they should be making. So if they're meeting that, then yeah, I mean, you don't need to look at the bank statements to see how much they're spending on beer and cigarettes every week. You have to assume that if they're meeting, you know, if they're making three times the rent, that they're going to be able to make the rent. Yes. And if they have a good rental history to support that and no history of bankruptcies, judgments, liens, evictions, or any of anything else that you identify in your screening criteria, then case closed. I mean, you really don't need to look at their bank statements and spend that much time and energy thumbing through every individual transaction to see what they're spending their money on. It's invasive, to yes. be honest with you. And like I said, you're, you're going to scare, you're going to scare the tenants away for sure. Good tenants. Right. You're going to scare them away and you're not going to accomplish anything that can't be accomplished through other means, which is the biggest part of it. You know, yeah. Why put up a big roadblock for something uh, that could scare away good tenants when you can accomplish the exact same stuff through all of these other means and methods? Right. You know, and one of the uh, the other things, a couple of months ago, we considered, you know, like we do a lot of times is uh, we partner with other third party companies or vendors um, in, in using their service. So I'll give you an example. Dwala. Uh, DWOLA is one company that that we support and uh, certainly you know endorse the use of it to be able to collect electronic rent payments. Right. Um, great company, good concept, uh, very friendly to landlords, and so that's something that we can get behind. In the banking industry, there is one company. I won't name it by names, but just know that there's one option out there as a landlord that you have to electronically gather somebody's banking information. And um, we considered this and I looked into it and I, I certainly did my homework on how it works and how this product or service works and how it could benefit landlords. And the reason that we don't endorse it is because I thought, this is insanity. Nobody's going to ever do this. The way that it works is you you email a request to the applicant, to the potential tenant, and the request basically says something to the effect of, we're going to be looking at 90 days worth of your bank statements. And to make it easy for you, we're going to do it electronically. Which sounds <laughs> Right. Which sounds great, right? Nice and convenient. Except the applicant has to list their username and password for their online banking. Really? Which I, yeah, which I thought was insane. Like who would ever in a million years give that information up? So we, I mean, it just, we couldn't do it. I mean, no. I thought, well, I use a third-party company. If somebody's crazy enough to give you their username and password and you're 
nosy enough to go look, just log in as them and look at their bank information. But, you know, you can't trust something that's asking you for your online banking password. So, you know, I just didn't feel comfortable and to be honest with you, I just didn't feel like it was a reasonable uh, service that anybody was going to say that they, they liked. And I, I was just imagining all the, you know, petrified tenants that's going to be calling us saying, why, <laughs> yes. why do you need, why do you need my banking password? Um, so we decided not to go with it, but just to, you know, just to put it out there for landlords, there's not really a reasonable option. So don't look, don't even bother looking. <laughs> right. There's not a reasonable option. The only way to do it is to say, hand it to me, you know, give me your three months worth or whatever. Um, and, and again, you know, there's, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're going to agitate, uh, people that otherwise you wouldn't need to. Right. Well, great. Thank you very much, Stephen. I look forward to talking with you tomorrow evening. All right. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for listening to Landlord University. And remember to visit rentprep.com slash landlordu to see show notes and access free resources like forms and guides. And be sure to check out Jeff Pearson hosting his own hit podcast at thementorimpact.com.